As we look around us in this complex world, we see information everywhere. From the cars we drive, to the mobile phones we use, to the image you're watching right now. Information is everywhere and is an essential part of our lives. We're drowning in information and yet starving for knowledge. With so much information all around us, have you ever stopped to ponder the information of life? The code that's in every cell, every piece of DNA, and all living things. Hi, my name's Chris, and we're going to dive deep into the world of cellular biology and information science to see if we might get a little closer to the big question, where did we come from? You know, even though we've made many breakthrough discoveries in science, there's still so much more to be discovered. It will be through these discoveries that we'll be able to cure disease, improve our well-being, and possibly discover the origin of life. And with the most common worldview of life's origin being chemical evolution, how does this scenario align itself with our knowledge of information science? Information science is changing the way that we think about all living systems. So what is information? Is order and organization information? When we look at nature, we see a lot of organization. Salt crystals, stalactites, even a sand dune could be considered organized. However, these would be considered examples of self-order. What about a simple snowflake? Is there order to its structure? Look under a microscope and see in amazing detail these exquisite patterns. Water, cold air, gravity, and time gives you snowflakes. In a cavern, water, minerals, gravity, and time equals stalactites and stalagmites. How about a tornado or a hurricane? These are powerful self-ordered forces, but do they contain meaningful information? The answer is no. They do contain data, which is determined by physical constraints, but not information. The behavior of these things are governed by what we now know as the chaos theory, which simply stated, is the study of how order forms naturally without design. How about a penny? It would seem strange to say that this object has order and organization, but no information. After all, a piece of metal could never become this perfectly round on its own. The letters and imagery clearly show information and organization as well. Could Mount Rushmore in South Dakota have occurred from years of exposure to the elements where the soft rock has eroded away while the hard rock remained, giving us the impression of past presidents? Not likely. So the real question is, can information form by chance? It seems that things containing information are highly organized, but there's more than just order. Much more. Information is intangible because there's always a sender of the information and there's always a receiver of the information that has some ability to decipher the information, decipher the, the meaning behind the information that's being sent and then changing into some meaningful, useful purpose. Information must have a sender and receiver in order to communicate. For instance, these flashing lights have no meaning to us. But what happens when we place them in a straight line and add color? Now we recognize the code that's being transmitted directing us to stop at red and go on green. This preconceived knowledge is important and it makes a big difference in our everyday lives. In fact, without this knowledge, our travels would become quite chaotic and dangerous. So you see that even a simple code like these traffic signals can be considered information if knowledge is sent and received. In a moment, we'll discuss the information in living systems, but first, let's discuss three main categories of information that scientists use. 
The first is called Shannon information. Shannon information provides only a mathematical measure of probability. Like if we rolled a die 100 times and recorded the results. This would give us data, but it would be random data, not useful information. The second category is called functional information. This is information that's useful and practical, like our traffic lights. Information is sent by the source and understood by the receiver in order to ensure safe travel. The last category is called prescriptive information. Prescriptive information is what we're going to be primarily focusing on. It's instructional information used to determine what choices to make and could even be based on a record of choices already made. In order for something to be considered prescription, the receiver of the message must have the knowledge of the source's alphabet, rules, and encryption in order to decipher the message and act on it. For instance, have you ever seen what software code looks like? At first glance, it just looks like a bunch of random characters. However, if you know what those characters represent and you have a system to decipher the code, you can understand and create extremely powerful prescriptive programs. Think about it. What at first appears to be just meaningless ones and zeros is actually information, knowledge, just waiting to be interpreted and executed. It's incredible to think about how much information exists all around us. New York City is a pretty busy place. The traffic, the people, the messaging, the systems of transportation. But when comparing a living cell to this great city, New York pales in comparison. A cell is so complex that scientists have only scratched the surface of what really goes on in there. However, even with our limited understanding, what we do know is that the inner workings of a simple cell are simply extraordinary. It's almost like there's a miniature city and every cell and everybody has their own little job. If uh, the, all the traffic lights decided to all just go crazy, you have issues that not only are do we fix the light, but also we have traffic issues, we have crime issues, we have problems that snowball from one part breaking down. Amino acids are the most basic building blocks of life. Each amino acid is an organic molecule that has a carboxylic acid and amine group attached to the same carbon atom. Here are two organic molecules that have the same composition but are mirror images of each other. These are known as right-handed and left-handed amino acids. Amazingly, living organisms only use and produce left-handed amino acids. Scientists have no explanations for this. When amino acids are created in a laboratory, an equal number of left-handed and right-handed amino acids are produced. It's a fascinating mystery that living systems only produce and use left-handed amino acids. Equally fascinating, these amino acids have many different functions. One particularly important function is its role as the building blocks of proteins. Proteins are linear chains of amino acids. Every protein is chemically defined by its unique sequence of amino acid residues. Just as the letters of the alphabet can be combined to form a variety of words, amino acids can be linked together in varying sequences to form a vast variety of proteins. Even the simplest life generally has thousands of proteins. These proteins are essential to organisms and are involved in virtually every process within a living cell. Proteins have structural and mechanical functions. For instance, in muscles and the cytoskeleton, they help to maintain cell shape, while other proteins are important in cell signaling, immune responses, cell adhesion, and the cellular life cycle. One particular protein called a motor protein transports various cellular cargo, like energy-producing mitochondria to cellular neighborhoods in need of fuel. They can also provide the pulling power needed to separate chromosomes during cell division. Amino acids carry information from one part of a cell to another, as well as to other cells within the organism. So as you can see, without amino acids and proteins, 
basic cell structure as we know it could not exist. Other important types of proteins are enzymes. Enzymes are catalytic proteins that have special slots which hold other molecules to make chemical reactions possible. There are over 2,000 enzymes, and each one is used to enable a chemical reaction without ultimately being altered itself. It's been observed that the slowest biological reaction would take a trillion years without an enzyme, but the same reaction takes only a hundredth of a second when the enzyme is present. Pretty impressive. Adenosine triphosphate, otherwise referred to as ATP, is the energy source the enzyme uses to enable the reaction. Living organisms require and manufacture these enzymes along with all the other proteins. Let's briefly examine how proteins are created. This animation demonstrates how the digital information encoded within DNA is used to direct protein synthesis. This is a DNA double helix containing the digital code which directs the cell in all aspects of operation. And here we see a protein complex called an RNA polymerase traveling down the DNA strand. As it moves down the strand, it carefully unwinds the DNA, preparing it for transcription. Inside the polymerase, we see a single-stranded copy of the original instructions being assembled as individual bases are positioned and added to the growing strand. A stop code marks the end of the protein specification, at which point this copy, known as a messenger RNA transcript, exits the polymerase and heads towards a two-part chemical manufacturing machine called the ribosome. While the messenger RNA moves towards the ribosome, transfer RNA molecules attach to specific amino acids in preparation for assembly. As the messenger RNA transcript passes through the ribosome, the process of translation begins. Using the instructions encoded on the messenger RNA as a template, the transfer RNA molecules align specific sequences of bases to corresponding amino acids, creating a protein chain. As this chain exits the ribosome, it is met by chaperones which prevent premature folding, while escorting the protein to a barrel-shaped machine called a chaperonin. This machine helps fold the protein into the precise shape required to perform its function. Although it is unclear how the chaperonin achieves this, we do know that accurate folding is essential in order for the protein to accomplish its intended function. Once the protein is complete, it is released into the cytoplasm to do its job. As you can see, protein synthesis is an amazing process which occurs constantly in our bodies. Now, get this, ribosomes are made from RNA and proteins, so the ribosomes are made of the very proteins they manufacture. In fact, it takes over 150 existing proteins to manufacture just one protein. So in essence, it takes a protein to make a protein. It's this chicken and egg scenario that continues to baffle scientists. There are thousands or millions of interacting computers in every cell that uh, communicate with one another. They read the information, they transfer information from one component to another component. There are many different uh, operating systems involved. There are different programming languages involved with the various components that are within the cell. And all of them have the same components that any other computer would have. Bill Gates, who pioneered the personal computer and founded Microsoft, once said, human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. The implications of this statement are quite profound and controversial. It seems as if Mr. Gates is calling things in our cells information and DNA a kind of software program. Most typically think of a computer as something we use to access the internet or to email a friend. However, that's an example of an electronic computer. We also have mechanical and biological computers. The necessary and sufficient components of any functional computer are memory for data storage, 
an executable program containing instructions for processing data, the processor, which executes the instructions, and the capability to produce meaningful output. Many components of cells are components of real biological computers, equivalent to the components of electronic computers. For instance, DNA and RNA can hold prescriptive information or algorithms, and proteins can be used to hold, transfer, or process data. Proteins are the output generated by the translation process of a ribosome's computer system. Scientists have also discovered something known as the interactome, which is an incredibly dynamic network used by the cell for internal communication. It's like the Internet of the cell, where proteins, RNA, and DNA can stay in constant communication with each other. We also know there is a cell-to-cell -cell exchange of information integrating our entire body. So, how accurate was Mr. Gates? Well, in 2010, the noted microbiologist Craig Venter and his team accomplished an incredible feat, surpassing their previous accomplishment of determining the complete sequence of the human genome. They created the first computer-designed, synthetically produced genome, which is the set of application programs for an organism. This artificial DNA had over one million letters of genetic code that were then read, processed, and executed by the computer systems in the target cell's nucleus. Thanks to Vetter, these biological computers are no longer theoretical. They are experimentally verified. In an interview, Venter stated, Life is basically the result of an information process, a software process. Our genetic code is our software, and our cells are dynamically, constantly reading that genetic code. When cells were discovered over 300 years ago, it was thought that the structure of a cell was very simple. With the inventions of the electron and proton microscopes, we now have a much clearer understanding of the intricacies of life. The cell is an extremely efficient and well-networked computer system with thousands or even millions of processors and billions of bits of information. Cells are the structural and functional units of all living organisms. Some organisms, such as bacteria, are unicellular, consisting of a single cell. Other organisms, like humans, are multicellular, having many cells. In fact, it's estimated that an adult human has over 100 trillion cells, and each cell is an amazing world of its own. It can take in nutrients, convert the nutrients into energy, carry out specific functions, and reproduce itself as necessary. Even more amazing is that each cell stores its own set of instructions for carrying out each of these activities. Let's take a closer look at how a cell works. The first thing we see is the cell membrane. Much like the firewall software on your computer, the membrane contains protein gatekeepers, allowing only those components into the cell that belong and rejects all other components. Once we pass through this membrane, we see the organelles, or the organs of the cell. Ribosomes are the computer-controlled protein manufacturers of the cell. By fastening to an mRNA and using it as a template, the ribosome arranges amino acids in the correct sequence to form a particular protein. This process is known as translation. Golgi body. Next, we find a Golgi apparatus, also known as a Golgi body. Found in both plant and animal cells, Golgi bodies package and store proteins. Much like a post office, the Golgi packages and labels items, which it then sends to different parts of the cell. It's composed of membrane-bound stacks known as cisternae. Each cisterna is made up of a flattened membrane disc and its primary job is to modify proteins, but it's also involved in the transport of lipids around the cell and the creation of lysosomes. Lysosomes. Lysosomes are spherical organelles which dispose of all the waste in the cell. These tiny organelles contain acid hydrolase enzymes that break up waste materials and cellular debris. The membrane around the lysosome allows the digestive enzymes to work at the 4.5 pH they require to break down the debris and dispose of it. Without the lysosomes, the cell would become overwhelmed with debris and ultimately self-destruct. Mitochondria Mitochondria are the power plants of the cell, generating most of the cellular energy known as adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. In addition to supplying ATP, 
Mitochondria are involved in a range of other processes, such as signaling, cellular differentiation, cell death, the control of the cell cycle, and cell growth. Nucleus The nucleus is the control center of a cell. This is where we find most of the DNA which contains the instructions needed to create other elements of the cells. Like the motherboard of a computer controlling its components, the nucleus directs the growth, metabolism, and reproduction of the cell, among other things. Life requires fully functional DNA, RNA, ATP, enzymes, and other proteins. If any of those components were missing or not working properly, life would fail to exist. This continues to generate several unanswered questions. How could non-living material develop the hardware and software known to be required by all living organisms? How did nature develop the arbitrary protocols for communication and coordination among the thousands of computers in each cell? These kinds of questions lead to interesting discussions among scientists. Those who adhere to a purely naturalistic explanation for the existence of life are left struggling to find mechanisms to create such a sophisticated information source. In any case, the existence of life is indeed a mystery, and it's an exciting topic for discussion, one which should encourage critical thinking. Let's examine what DNA is and how it works to better understand how information is used in the cell. Deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, is a long polymer of nucleotides, each nucleotide being a deoxyribose sugar molecule, one phosphate group, and one base. Nucleotides are joined together to form the DNA backbone. A second DNA strand then joins the first to form a double helix. You may recognize the code letters A, C, G, and T, which are the four bases used in DNA. These bases are adenine, A, cytosine, C, guanine, G, and thymine, T. Like the code in Mr. Gates' software, the sequence of the four bases encodes genetic instructions used in the development and functioning of all known living organisms. Once organized, this information is what makes up the gene. And genes, as we all know, contain the recipes for the components of life. Genes hold all the information to build and maintain an organism's cells, and they also pass genetic traits to offspring. Human DNA contains an estimated 20 to 25,000 genes in its approximately 3 billion base pairs. And did you know that if the DNA in an adult human's body were laid out end to end, it would be about 30 billion miles long? That's enough to travel the distance from the Earth to the Sun over 320 times. A gene contains both coding sequences that determine what the gene does and non-coding sequences that determine when the gene is active, as well as thousands of other regulatory functions. Less than 2% of the genome is for coding proteins. The other 98%, which used to be thought of as junk DNA, is now being studied to determine its functionality. Chemically, the DNA in, in the cells of my body is the same as that in a fruit fly, an orange, a hippo, an elephant. It's all the same chemically. The uniqueness to all of those species of living things lays in the information content of the DNA. So while the chemistry may be the same, the actual information that's embedded in that chemistry is very, very different. And the challenge for molecular biologists such as myself is understanding completely what that information means. When a gene is active, the coding sequence is copied in a process called transcription, producing a messenger RNA or mRNA copy of the gene's information. mRNA is produced by a protein that's over 3,000 amino acids long as it reads the genetic code. Wait a minute. How can messenger RNA require a protein that reads the genetic code, but yet the protein needs the messenger RNA to be produced? 
Could these have both come into existence at the exact same time with the meaningful information needed for both to operate properly? As you can see, much is still a mystery when it comes to the origin of this complex organic language. And what's fascinating to me, not only do proteins uh, create proteins, but we have proteins that are actually creating the DNA molecule. That's our blueprint. And yet on the DNA molecule, there are sequences of part of the DNA that are coded for those proteins. So the manufacturing plant needs the blueprint, and the blueprint, the DNA, uh, needs the manufacturing plant in order to actually create the DNA. So what came first, the proteins that made the DNA or the DNA that made the proteins? Once DNA is organized into a single coiled piece, it's then wrapped around a complex hierarchical structure of proteins. This is what is commonly known as a chromosome. There are 23 pairs of chromosomes in the human genome. A genome is a full set of chromosomes containing all the inheritable traits of an organism. And as we observe our surroundings, we can see there are many different genomes in existence, creating very unique and incredible organisms. If it seems like your body is constantly working hard, it is. Living organisms continually produce new cells through a process called cell replication throughout their entire lives. And here's how it works. First, we start with our DNA double helix. Helicases are molecular motors that use the chemical energy of ATP to break hydrogen bonds between bases and unwind the DNA double helix into single strands. This process is used for both replication and repair of the strands. If unwound, a single DNA strand would be about six feet in length. And yet, it fits into a cell which can't even be seen with the human eye. Remarkably, these strands are kept from tangling as they are separated and duplicated. Next, these strands are copied by enzyme-based computers, creating an exact replica of each original strand. Over 30 different proteins are required for duplication and repackaging of cellular components during cell division. It's from this tiny, masterfully complex cell that life is formed. All living organisms begin with one cell. As cell division takes place, we see multicellular organisms take form. When we stop to think about our own body having approximately 100 trillion cells, each group having a unique purpose, such as epidermis, the lungs, heart, skeletal structure, muscles, nervous system, digestive system, reproductive system, immune system, and the brain all working simultaneously to form this magnificent machine we call the human body, we begin to have an appreciation for the complexity, elegance, and beauty of life. And as we look around us at the millions of plant and animal species, it becomes incredibly breathtaking to ponder how much information and organization must take place for all of this life to exist. You know, we're all derived from a single cell, the zygote. And what marvels me is from this single cell, we get 250 distinct cell types, each of which has a very, very unique program. All of the cells, with a couple of exceptions, have a nucleus and have a genome. And that genome is the same across all the cells. So when we begin to, to think about the complexity of the genome, I think that's amazingly complex, how we go from a single cell to unique cells that have very specific programs of gene expression that are necessary for that unique cell to function. But we're only beginning to understand the information in our genome that directs those unique programs of gene expression. While we know a great deal about the cell and its functionality, we've only scratched the surface of its inner workings. Scientists are continually discovering new information and data concerning the cell and its DNA. As our knowledge increases, 
It gives us a deeper understanding of how complex a single cell really is. And as we ponder this miniature marvel, we begin to wonder, could this simple cell have evolved from the elements of the Earth over time? Is it possible for this to have happened by natural processes? Well, we're not the first ones to ask this question, and it's a difficult question to answer. In the field of information science, there are rules for probability which help us define and understand the possibilities of an occurrence. So to answer that question, we must first define the terms of probability. There are a number of important terms related to probability. Terms you may have heard, but you may have misconceptions as to their meaning. They are possible, feasible, probable, infeasible, and impossible. Without fully understanding the meaning of these terms, you won't be able to make an intelligent, informed decision concerning the origins of life. And when these terms are not understood, people can easily be misled into believing something is scientific fact, when in reality, it's just speculation. Well, let's get started. The term possible in the context of science means a non-zero probability. In simple terms, possible means the event could happen. But this term should only be used when known science demonstrates that to be true. It would not be scientifically accurate to state it's possible for a die to be rolled and end up on edge unless it's been demonstrated that the on edge result is, in fact, possible. Scientists commonly make the mistake of using the phrase it's possible when in reality they should be saying it may be speculated. Now, at first glance, this may seem like semantics. However, to an information scientist, these differences are what define science. If a person uses the term possible, then he or she must verify that the assertion they're making is indeed possible using known science. The term feasible is similar to possible because it too is a probability that also needs to be verified using scientific principles. If an outcome is feasible, it means it's capable of being done or carried out. On the contrary, when we talk about infeasible, we're saying it is impractical or unworkable, not capable of being carried out or put into practice. Now, an outcome is considered probable when its possibility of occurrence is at least 50%. For example, in rolling a pair of dice, it's probable that the sum will be greater than 6. Why? Well, there are a total of 36 possible outcomes when rolling a pair of dice, and of those 36 combinations, 21 of them lead to a sum greater than 6, giving us a .583 probability, or more than 50%, that the sum of both dice will be greater than 6 on any given roll. If the public is educated and understands the scientific meaning of probable and what it means to be possible, it will cause scientists to be more diligent and accurate when making their declarations. Impossible simply means there is a zero chance of occurrence. However, when a probability becomes too small, it can be deemed operationally impossible or infeasible, meaning that we understand the possibility of it happening is greater than zero, but for all practical purposes, it's recorded as impossible. Now, when something is deemed operationally impossible, it's still technically possible. So some scientists try to justify arguing endless hypothetical scenarios simply on the grounds that they're theoretically possible and then try to convince the public that something must have happened because it could have happened. An excellent example of this comes from the noted biologist George Wald. He once stated when asked about the origin of life, however improbable we regard this event or any of the steps it involves, given enough time, it will almost certainly happen at least once. Time is the hero of the plot. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible. The possible becomes probable. The probable becomes virtually certain. One only has to wait. Time itself performs miracles. Let's hope that future generations will develop a keen awareness of this kind of wordplay and use critical thinking to distinguish between probable explanations and pure unscientific speculation. The fact that you're watching this video shows that your instructor, and you, value critical thinking and the very definition of science. You want to know. You want to understand the world around you. And it's a beautiful thing to look out there and ask those questions and never allow yourself 
to be put in a box where you could only think of one possible explanation for how things came to be or how things work. Look outside the box. Develop that critical thinking to look at all the options and say, where does the evidence lead? And what is the best explanation for why this came to be? So what is the probability of a simple cell evolving by undirected natural processes? The probability of a single protein being formed by undirected natural processes is only 1 in 10 to the 164th power. That's 10 with 164 zeros following it. That's pretty big. The probability of life, a simple cell evolving by undirected natural processes, is 1 in 10 to the 340 millionth power. That is unimaginable. Here's an illustration to help demonstrate just what this means. Here, we have one tiny grain of sand. It's been estimated that there are one million grains of sand in a half a cup. It would take one million half cups of sand to fill a swimming pool that's six feet deep and 30 feet in diameter. Now, if we took one billion of these pools of sand, we could fill Lake Tahoe in Nevada, which is about 22 miles long and 12 miles wide. Think you could find that original grain of sand we started with? We're not done yet. It would take about one billion Lake Tahoes to fill the volume of the Earth with sand. The probability of grabbing that original grain of sand out of the Earth filled with sand is 1 in 10 to the 30th power. It would take 100 million Earths to fill one sun with sand, and one trillion suns to fill our solar system, 10 trillion solar systems to fill one cubic light year, 100 trillion cubic light years to fill the volume of the Milky Way galaxy, and finally 10 billion Milky Way galaxies to fill the observable universe. Whew. That is a lot of sand. The probability of now randomly picking our original grain of sand from the entire observable universe is 1 in 10 to the 96th power. Still a far cry from our protein being formed at 1 in 10 to the 164th power, and even less chance of life evolving from undirected natural processes at the probability of 1 in 10 to the 340 millionth power. Starting to get the idea? Scientists generally consider anything with a probability of less than one part in 10 to the 70th power operationally impossible. And by the way, that calculation doesn't take into consideration the information that's stored in the cell, which directs the cell in all aspects of operation. That estimate is solely the chance of chemicals combining to form something living. So, the chance of life evolving and retaining the information needed to replicate itself is astronomically smaller than anything we know. And that's only one organism. Think about what it would mean for millions of complex organisms to have evolved from an undirected natural process. According to information science, the probability is so small that it's deemed operationally impossible. So, knowing all of this, should the popular scenarios of chemical and biological evolution be taught globally as the only explanation of the origin of life and species? It's my belief that we're not opening our minds to the possibility of other explanations. Now, one of the most basic concepts you should have learned is that if observations and data contradict the theory you're testing, then the theory should be modified or abandoned. Unfortunately, this doesn't seem to be happening to the present, most popular model of origins. Instead, many scientists are trying to take information and make it fit the evolutionary models. But is that good science? Critical thinking is required to realize the information science aspects of this and to make sure that whatever scenarios you're coming up with do not violate the principles of information science. Too often, scientists, they believe that information can be generated by physical processes, and that simply is not true. Functional information cannot be generated from purely physical properties.
Sigmund Freud once said, from error to error, one discovers the entire truth. As we examine history, we are constantly reminded of our ever-evolving thoughts in science. We look at the ideas of the Earth being flat, or being the center of the universe, or the cell being the simplest component of life. And while these theories seemed promising at the time, we have discovered they are completely incorrect. As we learn more about this amazing world in which we live, we start to understand the complexity of its workings. And in the case of the cell, the more we research, the more complex it seems to be. As we gather information, it is up to us as scientists, students, and colleagues to bring science to a level of integrity and critical examination that it deserves. If we approach science with an unsupported prearranged bias, then what we're trying to accomplish is not really science at all. The beauty of science is that we're able to move away from accepted dogma to examine the evidences. It's not up to us to disprove a given theory. It's up to the theory to prove itself against the laws of science. If a theory fails to do this, then it should be rejected, and we should search for more knowledge in order to, as Sigmund Freud said, discover the entire truth. The possibility of life evolving using the known laws of chemistry and physics is operationally impossible. When we consider the laws of information, that possibility now becomes impossible. Meaningful prescriptive information cannot arise from nothing, no matter how much time you allow. And until we acknowledge this, we will never discover the origin of life. Thank you for joining me on this amazing journey through science and the programming of life. I would challenge you to examine the evidences and join the growing community of critical thinkers. Until next time.